we've been dealing with challenges, principles, and values of the Christian faith in the context of the book of Matthew. Um, I want to jump in to chapter five. If you turn with me, hopefully you have your Bible. It is a, tell somebody, it's a BYOB affair. You got to bring your own Bible because <laughs> we know God wants to speak to your heart. Uh, so I just want to just hit some of the fundamentals. Again, I encourage you to check out his series because he does give a, a more in-depth teaching on it. And as I share, when I started out looking at this book, we were going to do kind of an overview and delve in as the Lord leads. Um, this is one where we'll do more of an overview. We spent more a, a very detailed amount of time last week for anybody who missed it, looking at the um, temptation of Christ and, and the whole concept of temptation, how it is the enemy uses that in our lives uh, so in chapter five we talk about the beatitudes um who is speaking of course this is jesus if you have a red letter bible you'll see it's jesus speaking um who is he speaking to uh, let's look at it if we start with um scripture i'm going to read it says verse one and send the multitudes he went up on a mountain, and when he was seated, his disciples came to him. Then he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when they revile and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Amen. So he's, we see who he's speaking to right there. Uh, it says in uh, verse one, and seeing the multitude. But if we peek back into chapter number four, it gives us a little more detail about who that multitude is. Who are those folks? Um, if you look in chapter four and verse 23, it says, and Jesus went about all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing all kinds of sickness and all kinds of disease. And so when we um, look, we see where these multitudes came from. Keep reading. Then his fame went throughout all Syria. And they brought to him all sick who were afflicted with various diseases and torments, and those who were demon-possessed, epileptics, and paralytics, and he healed them. Great multitudes followed him from Galilee and from Decapolis, Jerusalem, Judea, and beyond the Jordan. So we see all of these people um, and uh, we have sick people, demon-possessed people, paralyzed people, all kinds of people that have come to him from all over these regions and have followed him. And now he has come up on the mountainside to sit down to pray. We know that his MO, his motive op modus operandi, his purpose in, in walking the earth around, he set an example for us because what he is doing is what we also should be doing, healing the sick. And, and uh, preaching the gospel and sharing the good news everywhere that we go. And then who else was there? The disciples we see in um, verse, same verse one, it says, and he, uh, and seeing the multitudes, he went up on a mountain and when he was seated, his disciples came to him. If you flip back, you can see who they are. Um, it's not limited to this, group that we call the apostles or the 12 disciples but it certainly included them uh, verse 18 in chapter 4 and jesus walking by the sea of galilee saw two brothers simon called peter and andrew's brother 
cast their net into the sea, for they were fishermen. Then he said to them, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. And I don't want you to lose that. Hold that in your thought. We'll come back to that. They immediately left their nets and followed. Going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, in the boat with Zebedee, their father, mending their nets. He called them, and immediately they left the boat and their father and followed him. And so when we look at a disciple, what do we see commonly? They are followers. A disciple typically, and when we say the, the word disciple, it was referring to students of rabbis in this context or philosophers in a more broader context. But I'm a follower of Christ, meaning that I study his ways. I follow his pattern. I'm his student. And so we see right here the clear example that when Jesus called them, what did they do? They left everything. They got up and followed him. And if we're going to be disciples, what are we called to do? The very same thing. So a disciple is a student of rabbis or, or philosophers, normally committed, watch this, to memorizing and living according to their master's teaching. And so Jesus is giving us his word, his, uh, his um, truth. And as students of Jesus, what should we be committed to? Memorizing and living according to their master's teaching, to our master's teaching. What did he tell us that we, how should we live? He said, follow me. And what's one thing he would do? Make you a fisher of men. If you're following Christ and not fishing for men, then you're following from afar. You're following in part, but not totally. Because one of the key things about following Christ is that we try to mimic Christ. We go about trying to heal the sick. We go about teaching and preaching. We go about having compassion. And we go about fishing for men. He came to seek and to save that which is lost. When we're in the midst of people that are lost, and you don't have to go far. Look, probably right there in your own home, but certainly in your neighborhood, at work, there are people who don't know Christ. And so as fishers of men, our call is to teach them about the Lord, to share the good news of the gospel, to tell them that in Christ their sins are forgiven. And because of uh, um, our willingness to do that, he uses us to fish. What does that mean? To catch, to draw men unto him. If I be lifted up, what did he say? I will draw all men unto me. I'm using you like a fisher uses a fishing rod. What does that fishing rod do? It's the ang it, it puts the, the hook out in the water, so to speak, the pull in the fish. We are a part of that process as we yield ourselves and follow him. So we should be telling others about the Lord every opportunity that we get because if we're following him and we're not bothered by the loss, then again, I say we're following him too far behind. We're too, there's too much distance between our heart and his. He cares about those who are lost. He cares about those who don't know him as Savior. So as children of the light, as children of God, we too should be living according to his teachings and seeking to save those who are lost, seeking to be fishers of men. But I also highlighted this. They are normally committed to memorizing their master's teachings. And it's funny because over the last week, this has been on my heart a bit, that we memorize scripture. Remember Psalm 119.11 says, Thy word have I hidden in my heart that I might not sin against thee. You, me, every person who's following Christ should be committed to memorizing scripture. Uh, it's good to be able to turn to it, but sometimes you won't have it in front of you to turn to. You want that word hidden in your heart. And you want to hit in your heart, not just for the sake of being able to call it up to help somebody else, but for your own sake. That word is alive, it's active. And it will cause you to mature in Christ as you meditate on it. Remember Romans 12, 1 and 2, as I am renewing my mind, I am being transformed. I'm being changed into his very image. And so the very word that I'm handling is like a, a rotor rooter. You know, it's cleaning me out. It's purging me. It's washing me on the inside so that I can look more like Jesus Christ. 
memorizing scripture, I can't emphasize it enough, has been life changing for me. It has caused my heart to be pricked. It has caused my mind to be renewed and changed, my thinking to change. And the more we do it, the more our minds align with Christ, the more we look like Jesus. And so I'm challenging us each to begin to spend more time memorizing scripture. If we're going to be his disciples, right? If we're going to follow him, we want to know his teaching. If you ask a, a student of Freud anything about his philosophy, anything about his theories, they can whip it out. They don't have to go find their book. They can tell you. We likewise want to know Christ's word like that so that at any given moment we can share it wherever we go. So here's some basic principles or, or uh, ways in which you can memorize scripture. If you don't already use these basic uh, principles and you can start. I'm going to challenge you to try to memorize a verse each week. Uh, and that's not just for class, that's for your life, that's for your walk, that's for your discipleship. First thing it says is read and meditate, right? So when we want to memorize something, it's just like if you had a history test coming up in a few weeks, you would memorize the dates, you would memorize the events, you would remember and memorize whatever the key facts are that your teacher told you. As scripture is there's nothing more valuable than that, obviously. As we read it and meditate it over it, it helps to get it in our spirit. We need to do that over and over again. We don't do it like one time and then say, oh, I can't remember. No, again, if you were taking a test, you would read that thing over and over. You would make notes on it and all of that, which is the second thing we want to encourage you to do. Write it down. When I was... Uh, taking classes where I had to memorize things, I would always write them down. And that is another way in which I get it in my spirit. Because as you write it down, your mind has to begin to process it. It's like trying to explain a math problem. The teacher would call you to the board because they know as you write it down, it gets more embedded in your psyche. Uh, I remember years ago reading something like you're 95% more likely to remember a thing if you write it down. So I encourage you, not only do you read it, meditate on it, you write it down. As you might write it down, you know, I don't know if you were like me when you were little, but I used to get in trouble in class for talking too much. And the teacher would hold me back after class. And you got to write 500 times, I will not talk in class. And of course, we come up with the way to make the I all the way down the page and then put the lines <laughs> so we can try to do it more quickly. But the point is, she was trying to drill it in my head. I will not talk in class. How about if I'm memorizing a verse, I can write it over and over again until God drills it down into my spirit. And even uh, in doing so, it makes me, as I meditate on it, it makes me become more aware of what its meaning is. Uh, as I write it out, you know, one thing that I remember when I first learned how to memorize was to uh, pick it apart. In other words, look at the verse um, and break it down into pieces and, and look at what each part of it meant. So that as I was writing it down, I was personalizing it and not just writing something to be writing it. And the more I am uh, process it and made it personal and internalized it, the more I was likely to remember it. Uh, if I was going to recommend uh, a scripture for you to start with, for those who maybe you, you haven't been one who um, memorizes scripture, I would recommend, let's go over here to Galatians. And where would I take you first? There's so many different verses here that are powerful. That uh, are some of those ones that you want in your spirit, so to speak. Uh, 
Uh, let me see, let me see. I thought I had it in my hand a second ago. Here's an easy one for you to start with. In Ephesians chapter number five and verse number one and two. And one is extremely easy, but two will go along with it. Therefore, be imitators of God as dear children. Verse 2, and walk in love as Christ also has loved us and given himself for us and offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet smelling aroma. Why? Because all those things, those truths, as I meditate on them, be an imitator of God. Uh, unpack that. What does that mean if I'm imitating? Years ago, there was a song out that said, if I move, you move just like that. You know, as I meditate on this, I think about how does God operate? God is love. God is patient. He's kind. I want to imitate that. So I want to drive that home in my spirit. So these are simple verses that you can start with. Uh, there are obviously many, many verses um, in fact, what I think I'll do is put together a list of verses that I'll share with you um, so that you can have them that we want to have in our spirit, so to speak, critical verses that make us know ourselves in Christ, who God would have us to be. Um, and then lastly, you recall the verse. What does that mean? You just practice it. Uh, you got a neighbor, a friend, a parent, a child, a cousin, boo-boo, somebody. Just say, hey, hold this paper. This is the verse I'm memorizing. And tell me if I mess up. And you just keep practicing. Keep practicing until it becomes first nature for you. And once you have a scripture in your spirit like that, it will be life changing. And you'll be amazed. I have found over the years how many times I've called up scripture that have ministered to me and then ministered to others. You know, Philippians. Uh, four, six, and seven. Again, one of those ones you want in your spirit. Uh, Luke nine twenty three. All these are scripture that should be a part of your arsenal, so to speak. Um, and so I just encourage you. Get in your word. Begin to write out scripture. When you're doing your quiet time each day, as a verse pops out in your spirit, put that on your list of memories, memorization. And every week, pick up a new one. Until over time, now I confess I've never done it, but I know people who have memorized whole chapters and I know people who have memorized whole books, like the whole book of John, the whole book of Matthew or the whole book of Romans, like from eight, verse one, <laughs> chapter one, all the way to the end. Now, again, I confess I haven't done it. That's my next challenge for myself, uh, but it has been life changing to memorize scripture. So I encourage you to do that, okay? And the one of the ones we read tonight, uh, Come Follow Me, that was one of my early ones too. I'll make you fishes of men. That's one of those you want in your arsenal, okay? All right, let's keep it moving. So what is Jesus speaking about? We know he's talking to his disciples and to the multitudes. What's he talking about? He said how to be blessed. He is telling us what we can do to live a blessed life. So how can I be blessed? First of all, what is blessed? It means of or enjoying happiness. It means being happy. If I want to have a blessed life, a happy life, a joyful life, a life that I can enjoy, he's telling me some clues. He's giving me some instructions as to how to do that. Um, enjoying the bliss of heaven. Of course, ultimately, we want to go to heaven. I don't know about you, but I want to go to heaven. Uh, and bringing pleasure, contentment, or good fortune is a general definition of blessed. And so when we think of blessed, it means that I'm living a good life. I'm living a life of happiness, of, of pleasure, of contentment in Christ Jesus. And how can I do that? Of course, the Holy Spirit, his fruit gives us peace. Uh, but there's actions that I can take, things that I can do to bring about a more enjoyable lifestyle for myself. What does God tell us? Here's how to be blessed. Have these eight attitudes, uh, the, the attitudes we call them. 
But these are the types of dispositions that God is telling us if we have them, we'll live a blessed life. Okay? What's the first thing he says? Blessed are the poor in spirit. And we read it already uh, in verse number three. What does that mean? Somebody who recognizes their brokenness, somebody who recognizes their emptiness, that I cannot do anything without Christ. I, I need him to live righteously. I can't do it in my own strength. What will happen? Note that every time he tells us how to be blessed, he then tells us the blessing that will come with it or, or the, the promise as Pastor likes to refer to it. There's a principle and a promise in all scripture. And in this instance, if I, if I walk in this kind of attitude, this is the blessing that I'm going to get. So I will inherit the kingdom of God. I'll be a part of God's kingdom because I recognize that I am broken without him. I need him. I need him as my savior. I need his righteousness because I have none of my own. And once I accept that, then I can be saved. I can be a part of his kingdom. One of the challenges in encountering some people who, especially people who um, think that they are all that, they don't recognize their need for God sometimes. Uh, especially it can be difficult, as Jesus said, hard for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. Sometimes because we have material wealth and we have our needs met, we don't think we need God. Sometimes it's the, the wealth of ego, uh, pridefulness, that makes us think we, we don't need no anyone. We can do this on our own. But sad, the truth is nobody is able to enter into the kingdom on their own. There's none righteous, no, not one, the word of God says. So we have to come to a place where we recognize our emptiness, our brokenness, our poverty of spirit. Yeah. And when we do that and then embrace God's provision, which is the Lord Jesus Christ, then we shall be saved and inherit the kingdom of heaven. And I, I noted um, Isaiah 66 and 2, which says, the Gentiles shall see your righteousness and all the kings your glory. You shall be called by a new name, which the mouth of the Lord will name. Uh, you go back to verse one, just for sake of, of uh, context. For Zion's sake, I will not hold my peace for Jerusalem's sake. I will not rest until her righteousness goes forth as brightness and her salvation as a lamp that burns. The Gentiles shall see your righteousness. And of course, our righteousness comes from whom? Christ Jesus. He was and is the righteousness of God. And so when he died for our sins and we accepted him, we became the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus is what 1 Corinthians uh, 5 and 21 says. In other words, once I accept him for myself, then he gives me, uh, the, the fancy word for that is imputes, but he gives me his righteousness. He uh, puts it on me, so to speak. He pours it into my account, not because of anything I've done, but because of what he has done. And pardon me, it's 2 Corinthians 5, 21. Um, it's not because of my own righteousness, because I'm broke, I'm poor. If you put the, the equation up, my part is zero, God's part is seven, the completion, and then the answer is seven. So zero plus seven equals seven. I didn't bring anything to the table except a need. What's the next thing he tells us? Blessed are those who mourn. Who are the mourners? Of course, people who have had loss, people who are hurting, uh, lost loved ones, lost things, lost relationships, you know, mourning, grieving over something. Or those even who grieve, uh, I think of the prophet Jeremiah who wept over uh, Jerusalem. Of course, Jesus wept over Jerusalem um, and over the wickedness and the sinfulness of the people of God. Uh, when you see brokenness in the earth realm, you know, you grieve. The Holy Spirit in you is grieved. You're mourning as the Holy Spirit leads you because it, whatever breaks the heart of God breaks your heart. But those who mourn, what does it tell us? Uh, their reward is they shall be comforted. And of course, we know in 2 Corinthians 1 and 3, he tells us he is the God of all comfort and he will comfort us. And so those who mourn will be comforted. 
Let's uh, the meek. What do we know about the meek? Of course, the humble, those who are not walking in pridefulness, but those who walk in humility and a lowliness of spirit. God has made a promise. And what is that? They shall inherit the earth. Why? Because God gives grace to the humble. He opposes the proud, but he uh, appreciates and loves humility. Because if we look at Jesus, he was the model of humility. Though they abused him and they talked about him. And one minute they said, Hosanna, and the next minute they said, crucify. At some point, they tried to go to him to get him to defend himself, but he never opened his mouth. He remained humble. He allowed God, so to speak, to establish him. When you are walking in meekness, you don't try to puff yourself up. You allow God to be the one who exalts you. And so God honors that. Uh, he blesses that. And so we want to be a people who walk in meekness. And uh, inheriting the earth, uh, you know, God will bless you. He will prosper you. He will allow you to be uh, used in, in some realm, so to speak, because as uh, we are blessed to be able to be promoted, so to speak, in the things of God, as well as in the natural, as we humble ourselves, he keeps expanding our territory, so to speak. Um, in verse 11 of Psalm 37, it says, but the meek shall inherit the earth and shall delight themselves in the abundance of peace. As I walk in humility, I walk in the peace of God because I'm allowing God to, to take care of my battles, so to speak. I'm not going toe to toe. I'm not going tip for tat. I'm not cussing nobody out. I ain't giving nobody peace in my mind. I'm gonna wait on the Lord and be of good courage and trust him to work it out, whatever. I may or may not have to deal with in life. God has me because I humble myself and I walk after his ways. He will take care of the rest and grant me his peace. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. What's that mean? I'm desiring, I'm, I'm passionate about doing things God's way, living according to his will, walking after his heart. Um, I'm intense and intent about that and i'm intentional about that it's not a you know if i happen to get it i get it it's i'm pursuing the things of god somebody said i'm a god chaser i'm following hard after him what does he promise he said we shall be filled of course in acts 2 4 one example of that is being filled with the holy spirit but we shall be filled with the things of god with the blessings of god with the kingdom of god the, the promises of god but we also know that in terms of what God did on the day of Pentecost, he actually came out, uh, he poured out his spirit and each one spoke in other tongues as they were filled with the Holy Ghost. As you give your heart to Christ, scripture tells us that we will receive the deposit of the Holy Spirit. We will be filled, we will be full, we will be content in him. What does it tell us? Blessed are the merciful. Those who show mercy. My goodness, how many of us have gone to God and said, Lord, have mercy on me. You know, I messed up. Have mercy on me. You know, don't treat me as my sins deserve. And even bless me uh, in these, so to speak. But yet when it comes to someone else messing up, how is it that we can somehow look at somebody else and wag our tongue and our finger and and shake our head about how they messed up. But then we go to God and say, but God have mercy on me. It's as though we want God to be super abundant with mercy when it's us, but be stingy with mercy when it's someone else. Uh, you reap what you sow. If I want God to be merciful to me, I need to be merciful to others. Remember, remember we looked at the, the servant who's, um, owner called him to task and told him how much he owed and and then he begged and and his his boss man had mercy on him and wiped out his debt but as soon as he went down the street and somebody owed him some money he showed no mercy at all he wanted to have them locked up that's how we are sadly we have a hard heart 
when it comes to somebody else and we we hold them to the letter of the law where they're supposed to be a christian and they know this and they do that and they should know better and all that but somehow when it comes to us god should just understand our heart because he know we didn't mean so bad and i'm saying to us if we want to walk in the blessing of god the, the joyful living god wants us to have we got to have a heart of mercy we got to be willing to forgive us we we give mercy and what does god say we will obtain mercy. If you are merciful, the promise of God is that you will get mercy. But don't be shocked when God allows you to see the consequence of your being hard-hearted. He has a way of teaching us. He chastens those he loves. And sometimes he allows us to see the consequences of our own behavior without mercy when we refuse to show mercy to others. Um, and so when we do it God's way, we will be merciful and we will be kind because that's the way God is toward us. Amen. So what else? Blessed are the pure in heart. Who are the fish type of my bad? First Samuel 16 and 7. Uh, but the pure in heart, God looks at the heart. We look at the outward stuff. How how nice is her hair? How cute is her house and her car? What does he, what kind of job he has? And how much money he does he have? And what kind of clothes does he wear? Those are all lovely things, but that's not what values, that's not what's important to God. When he looks at us, he looks at our heart. He wants to see that we have a pure heart toward him, that we aren't hypocritical, that we aren't saying one thing and doing another. You know, that we are living in agreement with what we profess. Now, I know I'm the first to admit that I fall short of the glory of God, but my heart's yearning, my heart's desire is to get it right. And therefore, there are times when I have to repent and turn to him and say, Lord, forgive me and help me to do better. But it's another thing when we're like the Pharisees or like others who sit back in judgment, but yet we say we are Christ-like. And somewhere in there, those two don't agree. The only person who has the right to judge is God. And so we have to make sure that our hearts are pure and right before God. And we're not uh, living a dual lifestyle. Meaning it's that we, we preach or teach or, or share one thing on Sunday, but then we go home and there's a whole other dimension to it. And so we want to keep a heart that's clean and pure before God. And what does that happen? What is the blessing God promises us? We shall see God. None but the righteous. None but those who are in right standing, having been cleansed by the precious blood of the Lamb, shall see God. And so we want to keep our heart pure. Uh, we had a discussion going on the other day on, on whoso believe uh, that org about whether we should use the word dope in relation to God. You know, is calling God dope something good? You know, we know in the world's order dope is considered to be a positive thing but do we want to attribute that term to to a holy god and for some that's a conviction because of the pureness of heart each of us has conviction about things that bother us or concern us when it seems out of alignment with god's will when we have a pure heart we want to do what's pleasing to god we don't want to just go along with the crowd and so we want to keep our heart pure before god how do you do that? Stand in your word, keeping the word stayed in you so that your heart can stay sensitive to the things of God. Blessed are the peacemakers. We know God is peace. Uh, his, the fruit of his spirit is peace. He's, he came to bring us peace. He made peace between us and God. Jesus made peace between us and God by giving his very life, is what Colossians 1 tells us. Uh, we should be like him. If we're going to be his followers, we should be peacemakers as well, uh, not rebel rousers. How many know that uh, we have an aroma, so to speak? When we walk into the room, do we bring peace or do we bring confusion? Do we bring peace or do we bring uh, a bunch of discord? We should be the people who bring the peace. Uh, I was really proud of my husband. I remember years ago, we played softball for our church and they gave out awards and, and, and they gave him the uh, Christ-like award because he was always trying to make peace. If there was any discord, 
uh, in the midst of the, the game. And so we want to be the people who bring the shalom of God with our presence and make every effort to be at peace with others. And what's the, the blessing of that? You'll be called the son of God. Who can get a better name than that, than to be called God's son? Uh, that's, that's, that's higher than my little t-shirt, my acronym or, or my or moniker, rather. Uh, some of you have heard uh, me mention Hiroshi, who's over in Japan, wave to Hiroshi. He's watching, he and his mom. Hey, Hiroshi, we love you. And one of the things he said when I first met him, he asked me to pray for his dad. And long story short, God answered the prayer very quickly. And he, from that moment on, began to call me the woman that works for God. He said, God hears your prayers. And so it blesses me. I figured it couldn't get any better than that. But then I look at sons of God. I think sons of God trumps even the woman that works for God. So I'm saying to us, I want to be called God's son. I want God's people to see God in me such that they know you're a, I'm a child of God. And I pray the same for you as we walk in that peace. And then those who are persecuted for righteousness sake. Theirs is the kingdom of heaven. You know, one of the things that happens when you're seeking to do God's will is the enemy uses others to attack you. And I'm not talking about when we deservedly create chaos in our own lives, and sometimes we do. But I'm talking about when we seriously are being persecuted, attacked, or put down, disparaged because we're walking in obedience to God. And there are those who will hate on you. You haven't done anything to them. You don't even know them, perhaps. And they come at you or talk about you. Why? Because it's the God in you. Uh, I remember being at the prison, and this was a lesson that God showed me very early on. When people would come at me with a lot of negativity, and I would think, Lord, I don't even know these people. And he began to show me that the spirit of God in you has issue with the, the spirit of darkness operating in them. And therefore, they have... Uh, uh, they're going to attack you even though you've not done anything. And even sadly to say, those who profess to be in Christ have uh, attacked other Christians, disparaged other Christians. You know, somebody said it's because they're jealous and they want what you have. I don't know necessarily that what the motivation is, but I do know is that the enemy will use anybody. Just like when Peter uh, allowed the enemy to use him when, when Jesus was going to be crucified. He said, I have to be crucified. I'll rise on the third day. And Peter said, no, that'll never happen. And what did Jesus say? Get thee behind me, Satan. Anybody, if we're not careful, can allow the enemy to use us. But being persecuted, being ridiculed, being put down, even some have lost their lives as martyrs because their righteous stance was an offense to the things of the world, an offense to people who weren't like-minded, whose heart were not focused on the things of God. Hearts were not focused on the things of God. And what does God's word promise us? Not only will we be, uh, ours be the kingdom of heaven, we'll spend our eternity with him. But he also made some other promises. If you look at it, uh, let me go back, <clears throat> excuse me. He says that not only in verse uh, 10 does he say we'll have the kingdom of heaven, but verse 11 says, blessed are you when they revile and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely. That's the key word. Don't do something messed up and then think, oh, it's because, you know, I'm a Christian. They attack me. No, it's because you was doing something raggedy. But when you are living righteously and people attack you, it's not unheard of. Why? Because the unclean spirit, the dark and the light have a a friction have a challenge but he says blessed are you when they revile and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake rejoice verse 12 and be exceedingly glad for great is your reward in heaven for so they prosecuted the, the uh, persecuted the prophet and so you have an even greater reward in heaven when you go through hell on earth uh, so trust and believe this too shall pass Heaven is uh, eternally going to uh, be your place of rest. Uh, you're going to spend your eternity with Christ Jesus. Uh, but this situation we're in right now is temporary. 
Okay. So we are the salt and the light of the world. I know I did a very brief overview of the, um, the attitudes and I did that purposely because I encourage you to go and look at it more in depth with Pastor Jenkins, but also because it's something that is taught a lot, I think. Um, and so I just wanted to give a kind of an overview, but I wanted to um, look at who we are in Christ. Um, in addition to moving on from the Beatitudes, if you look in verse 13 in that same chapter 5, it talks about who we are as the children of God. If we operate in these attitudes, if we walk in the principles of God's word, if we live the life that God wants us to live, who are we? Look at verse 13. You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its flavor, how shall it be seasoned? It is then good for nothing but to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. If you lose your savior what does that mean what is salt it's the wisdom and grace exhibited in speech it's the words and the and the presence and the power of god operating in you by the spirit of god when you are the salt of the earth what does salt do in the natural if you put salt in a dish what happens it changes the flavor right it will make it you can get too salty even we don't want to be too salty where we so caught up uh, as that old adage goes, so heavily bound with earthly no good. You know, all, all we can do is pull scripture, but we can't live it. Uh, we, we're unrelatable. We can't be touched. Nobody can talk to us because they don't feel comfortable because all we can talk about is scripture, but we can't show the love that we're preaching about in the scripture. But God's will is that we would exhibit the wisdom and the grace of God, and, and we would be the, the, the element that changes the atmosphere when there's ungodliness, that we would be the element that changes the lives of others. As we are used of God, we are the salt, we are the flavor, if you will, that God sprinkles into the earth to bring us to be more like him. And so as salt again loses savor and become, you know, you have some old salt, it, ain't, it just doesn't taste like anything anymore. You just throw it out. So if you hang around the world so much and become like the world so much, that you lose your savior. You know, you got the too salty, you know, you so incredibly bound, you earthy no good. But then you got the other extreme where your salt is just, I can't even taste it. There's no difference. You walk, I walk in the office and your language sounds just like this. Your tones sound just like the folks who don't even claim to know Christ. I've had those situations where I walked up on people, especially when I was a chaplain, they didn't know I was around. And they, you know, were on the choir or they, were on this ministry or that ministry but then when i walked up to them they switched up the conversation real quick because they realized i was it. and i would always tell them you don't have to switch it up for me because guess who's here when i'm not god heard every drop of it so that's who you need to be concerned about uh, but we should always have that grace and that wisdom that presence that peace that love of god that we are changing the atmosphere by bringing in his advantage for his viewpoint as we step into the room he steps into the room as we step into the room his peace steps in his spirit steps in because he abides on the inside of us so we are the changers of the we're the shifters we're the ones that cause things to turn toward god what else does it tell us that we're the light of the earth the light of the world look at it again in verse number um Let's see, it picks up 17. Do not think that I came to destroy, I'm sorry, verse 14. You are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. When we are the light of the earth we're the light of the world we are that uh, beacon if you will that's like you know if you've been in darkness oh my goodness i went down to my father's hometown in marion south carolina i don't know if it's changed now but the last time i was there which wasn't all that long ago relatively speaking in terms of street light lit uh eras they had none i mean it gets dark 
And you know, a lot of those old dusty roads, and some of them are paved, some of them not as much. And it's pitch black. I mean, I'm talking pitch black. You can't even see your hand in front of you black. And when you are riding down that road, you need to know where you're going if you're going to be out at dark. But imagine if they would come along and put up a string of lights. Well, they would pave the way, would make clear. I remember years ago uh, watching the uh, Apollo 13 movie and how Jim Lowell, Lowell um, the, I guess the key to be on, the, on their trip, which was supposed to be um, a trip to the moon that went bad, of course, um, their, their heat shield blew up and uh, part of it ripped up part of the, uh, the module. And anyway, they got them back to Earth by the grace of God, but it was a, a failure in the sense that they never got to land on the moon. But he talked uh, uh, on a video while they were um, filling in time. You know how the network does when there's some crucial event going on and they'll start pulling out old videos. And they showed him and he talked about how one night he was in a plane he was overseas in japan i think he said and his whole cockpit went out he was lost in fact he had gotten separated from his his uh team and he was lost and he said the cockpit lights everything just went black so now you're lost it's dark outside and now your cockpit lights all go out he said but because of that he could see down on the water the wake of the big ship the the aircraft carrier that he was looking for the darkness allowed what was in the water to illuminate and because of that he said it was just like a trail that led him home the the light from the ship and the and the um, algae and all the things that lit up in the water he just followed it in and that's how he got back safely but the light is the key thing we are the light we're the way people can find their way to god if they encounter you, they should find their way to God. If they encounter me, they should find their way to God. Again, being a relatable, being real, being human, but yet being a voice through which God can speak love, can speak wisdom, can speak guidance, and can speak his truth. So when you see somebody who's lost or somebody who's having a tough time, you're that light, you're that salt that should make the difference in their life. Um, I was talking to a coworker earlier today. Uh, we lost uh, a, another coworker over ooh, at the end of last week. Um, was a terrible accident. Um, but right before that, they had lost someone very close to them. And right before that, of course, I had lost my cousin. So it was like I could hear in her voice a sense of overwhelmingness, and I I knew that was going on because she had been in my spirit. So as soon as I saw her, I went up to her and just tried to encourage her, and I could hear, you know, the the the, the struggle she had gone through. But I could also see that it was a relief for her to be able to talk about it. What's the point? In that moment, God was allowing me to be the light, to speak love, to speak encouragement to her, and to be the listening ear that she meant that she needed. That's our function. When, when we are his disciples, we mimic him. We are imitators of God. So when people encounter us, they hopefully can have a place where they can find peace, where they can find refuge, where they can find an outlet for, uh, and an inlet of love for their lives, but an outlet when they're going through and they need someone to share with. So all of these things are what makes us um, God's disciples these are the things that make us his children that, that reflect that we belong to him and so if if we examine ourselves if we're honest with ourselves and we look at ourselves and we see that that's not the case then we want to go back to the living god and say lord touch my heart purge me wash me help me you know go to the word again memorizing scripture planting that word in our heart we'll see slowly but surely changes taking place. Sometimes the difficulties that we're encountering is like the sandpaper God is using to rub the hardness out of our hearts uh, because ultimately that's the place that all of God's truth is manifest and that's in our heart. Um, when we look further, if we look at verse 17, Jesus is talking about 
the law. You know, we look at the Old Testament, how they had the Ten Commandments, and the law was given, right? So the question is, are we under law today? You know, are we still operating under the law? You know, the, the principle of the law, they had thousands of laws beyond the Ten Commandments that they made up uh, for how you should live your life. And so if you broke one law, one piece of it, you broke the whole law. And your righteousness, your, your right standing, your ability to go to heaven, if you will, was built on the law. And so they had to go through all these rituals, constantly trying to keep up with the law. And they would, uh, of course, sacrifice animals to make up for when they sin, because we know the wages of sin is death. And so they would sacrifice animals, but those animals could only temporarily cover or take away, if or, or cover, I guess, more appropriately, their sin, but it couldn't take it away like the blood of Jesus. So the question when Jesus came, he came as a, as a God of grace. Did that wipe out the law? Well, look at what Jesus said, verse 17 of Matthew 5. Do not think that I came to destroy the law or the prophets. I did not come to destroy, but to fulfill. For surely I say to you, till heaven and earth pass away, one jot or one tittle will by no means pass from the law till all is fulfilled. Whoever therefore breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches men to do men so shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does and teaches them, he shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I say to you that unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. So what is he saying here? He's saying that the Pharisees and the scribes weren't going to make it in. They were the religious leaders of their day. What, what were they saying to the average person? If they can't make it, I'm not sure I can make it. But look at what Jesus is telling them in essence. He's saying they are trying to live <laughs> excuse me, by the letter of the law. But if you go and look at their practices, they weren't honoring the law, but they were holding everybody else to it. Over and over, he criticized them because he would say that you hold, you know, you put all these weights on others that you yourself won't carry. In essence, they had the intellect, they had the knowledge of the law, but their hearts and their lives didn't reflect the law, right? When we walk with God, it can't be just a, a, a hypocritical, uh, theoretical knowledge of the word of God and trying to say, I filled all the dots, I, I, I crossed all the T's. It has to be that I fulfill the law. I have to complete it by living the life that Christ taught us to live. In other words, when we try to do it in our flesh, it's not going to work. You know, let me make sure I did this. Let me make sure I did that. Let me make sure I did this. Because ultimately, the way that I know I fulfill the law is to honor the pattern and the way that Christ did. In fact, he told us how to fulfill the law. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. So that we don't have to be um, guessing. He gave it to us in his word. Mm. Look with me in Romans chapter number 13. If he, because we always say we're not under the law, we're under grace. And Jesus just said, but I, I'm not wiping it out, I'm fulfilling it. What does that mean? Look at Romans 13, 8. Owe no one anything except to love one another. For he who loves another has fulfilled the law. So how do I keep the law? By doing what Jesus did, loving everyone. Because love does no harm to his neighbor. Love, look at verse 9, for the commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness. You shall not cover them. If there's any other commandment, are all summed up in this saying, namely, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. 
Love does no harm to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. So if I love you, I won't covet. I won't commit adultery against you. I won't, you know, steal from you because I love you. So once I get the mastery of love, then I've mastered the law because that's ultimately all the law was doing was giving us a breakdown of how to love, how to do things in a way that honors God. And what God's word is telling us, if you will yield your heart, if you will surrender your heart and let me have control, then you'll fulfill the law. You don't have to memorize all and make sure I got this one checked off. Let me make sure I got that. As long as I'm walking in love towards you, I fulfilled all of the requirements of the law. And a lot of times when we look at it from a legalistic standpoint, the Jewish people still operating the law, they're trying to make sure they cross every T, dot every I. When Jesus is saying it's all summed up in this, love your neighbor as yourself. If you do that, then you'll fulfill all the other requirements. Amen. All right. So I have an ambitious agenda. Let's see. I think I have one more. I don't think we're going to get to all of them. But if you look at the next thing it's talking about is murder and adultery. Both of those are really, again, about love and the matter of the heart. And I think I'll stop here and pick it up here next week. But I want you to look at real quickly. Verse 21. You have heard it is said to those of old, you shall not murder, and whoever murders will be that endanger your judgment. But I say to you, whoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be endanger your judgment. As you meditate on these next sections, what you see is Jesus is teaching. It's all about where your heart is. Because if your heart is toward anger and bitterness and malice, then you've already committed the thing in your heart is what he's saying. You haven't gone outwardly and done it, but you've already done it inwardly because God's looking at your heart. And again, so that we can have time to unpack this a little further, we'll pick it up from here next week.